Hi, I'm Nadia Combs, Chair of the Hillsborough County School Board. I want to welcome you to Hillsborough County Public Schools. We serve more than 200,000 students. That includes children in preschool through adults in our workforce program. I'm Henry Shake Washington, the Board Vice Chair. Our district is the seventh largest in America, and our team is made up of more than 24,000 people working at nearly 250 sites across the county. Our district is diverse and dedicated. Our board meetings are held in our board auditorium on select Tuesdays at 4 p.m. The best way to serve our students and our community is to involve you, the public, in what we do. You are welcome to email or meet with any of our board members and follow our district on social media. Board meetings are covered live by Hillsborough Schools TV on Spectrum Cable Channel 635 and Frontier Cable Channel 32. Meetings are also streamed live on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Closed captioning is provided on all broadcasts and past meetings are available in our online archive. We are interested in what the public has to say. We'll include time for audience comments before we address our business items. Our agenda and any supporting materials can be viewed online in advance. They are posted seven days before each meeting on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Our vision is preparing students for life. And that means all students, every day. Todos los estudiantes, todos los días. Thank you for your interest in education. With your help, we're making decisions that shape our community's future. The board meeting of July, 2020, July 25th, 2023 is called to order. Member Washington will now lead us in a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Thank you, Member Washington. We have no withdrawn items today. I need a motion and a second to adopt the agenda. I have a motion by Member Perez. I have a second by Member Vaughn. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. and it passes unanimously. Let the record reflect that all board members are present today. We have seven sets of minutes to be approved today. May 2nd, 2023, school board recognition meeting. June 6th, 2023, school board meeting. June 13th, 2023, school board workshop. June 20th, 2023, school board meeting. June 20th, 2023, special call board meeting. June 27th, 2023, special call board meeting. And July 11, 2023, school board meeting. I need a motion, a second to approve the minutes. I have a motion by Member Perez. I have a second by Member Washington. Any discussion? If not, please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. Board members, I'd like to go over the format of today's meeting. As a reminder, we're a nonpartisan board who believe all children can be empowered to learn, to succeed, and our decisions will be made with that understanding. To pave the way for efficient and effective agenda statements and or questions, board members will be, have five minutes to speak with 30 seconds for final thoughts. Afterward, the superintendent can respond. If you have further questions, you're asked to get back into the queue. Member Washington will now read the board guidelines. Thank you, Madam Chair. As we begin this afternoon meeting, let me quickly review the format of our school board meetings. Please silence all electronic devices. There are speakers in the room behind me that allow board members to hear the meeting upon stepping away from the dais. This meeting can be viewed with closed caption 
on live webcasts, on cable TV, and on video monitors here in the auditorium. Also, they can be viewed with closed caption in the online video archives. Thank you. We have three items scheduled for time certain, and that's 501, and that's a public hearing, 6 o'clock employee input, and then we have one other uh, item, two items time certain at 501. We will now move on to public comment. The board welcomes comments from citizens and values your input to the board. In order to provide the most comprehensive response to your comments, our staff will follow up with you and will keep our board informed about the responses. Our school board respects the public's right to speak to the board and we appreciate you taking the time to be here. However, it is requested when you address the board, comments are not directed personally against the board member or staff member, but rather directed at the issues. Any behavior intended to interrupt the orderly conduct of this meeting will not be allowed. Our civility policy is in place. When addressing the board, please state your name and speak clearly into the microphone. This afternoon, each speaker will have three minutes. Reminder that your three minutes start when you begin speaking. When there are 30 seconds left, you'll see a yellow light on the lectern, a red light, and a chime will indicate when your time is up. I, we only have a couple speakers today, I think one speaker. If the speaker will please come up. Mark Lutho Largo. Well, you have some uh, Charter schools here. This is pretty amazing. Plato, ha, <laughs> and uh, victory, victory on what? Yeah. Here's this headline: Tuesday was the Earth's hottest day ever. Yeah, cause and effect. And. Uh, so uh says here, the DeFure faces criticism over Florida's standards for black history, a rebuke over lessons that depict a benefit for enslaved people. Well, you know, they could put on their resume, they were great at handling whippings. They didn't mind children being stolen from them. And they could say lynchings didn't hurt at all. Yeah. The black people had a wonderful time back there under slavery. Ha, ha, ha. The defure, you know, what a great racist. It's the only way you can look at it. The only way you can look at it. Half of U.S. tap water is at risk. Study finds prevalence of forever chemicals, or as I like to say, poisons. And what are you pumping into your schools? Is it all filtered? I don't think so. The storm forecast heats up. NOAA, 40% of oceans are facing marine heat waves. Scientists call wildfire smoke the new abnormal. Climate change is quickening the pace for fires and heat. Well, again, it's cause and effect. These sick buildings that you continue to make, they're feeding the burning of the planet, ignoring the science of high performance, passive building, which I have been bringing for three thank decades. You, thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have no further speakers today. I need a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Gray. Please vote when your lights appear.
and it passes unanimously. I will now call on Superintendent Ayers to highlight our administrative appointments. Thank you, Chair Combs. We had one principal appointment on our 401A this evening, and it is my pleasure to introduce um, Christine wessel the new principal of Sumner High School. Uh, Christine began her career at East Bay High School as a social studies teacher in 2005, and from the years 2006 to 2013, she was also a social studies teacher at Leonard, and then continued as a social studies teacher back at East Bay 2014 through 2017. In 2017, she was appointed the assistant principal for student affairs at East Bay High School. 2020, she was appointed the APC of Magnet Curriculum at Jefferson High School. In her current role, she is the AP for Curriculum at Sumner High School, and on the 401A, it is our proud honor to introduce Christine Wessel-Q as the new principal of Sumner High School. Woo, gotta come up. Yeah, come on up. Yeah, you come, come on, on up. Come on up for the and family and friends, if you want to stand and recognize Christine as well, family and friends. Congratulations. Christine. Uh, Christine, as you all know, replaces Rob Nelson. Re Mr. Nelson, Mr. Nelson, please stand. Where are you at? Mr. Nelson, uh, former Principal Sumner, is a new regional superintendent uh, over high schools. So congratulations to both of you. And Christine, good luck to you. We are here uh, all to support you in your journey. Congratulations. Congratulations. And I'll give those families, if you want a few minutes to exit, congratulations. The following items will now be heard, C-101, C-102, C-301, C-901, C-903, C-905, C-1001, and C-1003. Start with 101, Adoption and Purchase of Recommended Instructional Materials, K-12 through Social Studies. Superintendent Ayers will highlight this item. Thank you, Chair Combs. Instructional materials for elementary, middle, and high school social studies have been reviewed by a District Instructional Materials Adoption Committee. Upon committee consensus, product selections were narrowed for a district-wide teacher review and teacher vo uh, vote. The committee evaluation process ensures that selected materials are aligned with course standards and provide current updated materials for classroom instruction. Uh, per Florida statute and school board policy, the district must provide a 20-day public review period and conduct a public hearing before the board can approve the purchase of a newly adopted material. The public review period was from June, 11, June 21st, 2023 to July 11th, 2023, with a public hearing conducted at our last school board meeting on July 11th. Thank you. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-101. I have a motion by Member Gray. I have a second by Member Washington. Any discussion? I know, um, yes, any discussion? Members, please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 102, sole source. 23121 SSD SK purchase of iReady reading and mathematics instruction, diagnostic and teacher toolbox for curriculum associates, LLC. Superintendent Ayers will highlight this item. Thank you, Chair Combs. iReady is a comprehensive assessment and instruction program that provides kindergarten through fifth grade teachers with supplemental resources to help students be successful in reading and math. In the 22-23 school year, iReady was an optional assessment and instructional program for teachers in grades K through five math and ELA, with the diagnostic assessment being optional for the first time in HCPS. The percent of students assessed in reading was 92% and in math was 85%. The percent of students who engaged in the personalized instruction part of the program was 93% in reading and 90% in math. There were over 460,000 teacher assigned lessons completed by students. Reading was 74 of those lessons passed. In math, there were over 730,000 teacher assigned lessons completed by students with 83% of those lessons passed. Based on usage from the previous year, it is expected that close to 90% of teachers will continue to utilize the full iReady program, including diagnostic, personalized instruction, and teacher assigned lessons, as well as the toolbox material. Thank you. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-102. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Gray. Member Gray, Member Vaughn, and myself, we all pulled this. Um, we'll start with, uh, you wanna start with Member Gray? We'll start with Member Gray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
I, I'm addressing uh, the news in a little different way. I see that we have only 50 percent of our students that are proficient in reading and math, which is a uh, unsatisfactory uh, situation as we move forward. Secondly, when we have schools that measure only 7 percent uh, of reading and math proficiency, that to me is an alarm bell. Uh, and I know that uh, I voiced that <coughs> with uh, Superintendent Van Ayers. My, my question is, when we had the eye ready diagnostic, it was expensive, but the teachers used it with full fidelity. And really, it did have that measure of uh, perhaps a little bit easier, but it did have a measurement of how students would do when they test when the testing has come forth. Now, fast forward, it's not, uh, I read is no longer required, but now, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, we have several different types of assessments. Um, not only I ready, which is 90% uh, used, which I think is, is a good thing, because teachers do need to choose what they want to and how they want to assess, but we also have unit assessments, youth monitoring, math assessments, dibbles, face-to-face -face assessments, and I wonder, if these amounts of diagnostic uh, conduits have really given, I want to say, warning si uh, si signals to our teachers that these are certain questions, areas that our students need to really dig deep in, because if they're getting watered down with so many assessments, I just wonder, that might not be a causation, that's just a hypothesis. Um, but it has been brought up by a staff member as a possibility. So uh, here's my question. When do we, uh, and it might be the district reading improvement plan, but when do we start measuring our students in a uniform way? So because reading is a number one, uh, I think, every board member agrees, a number one uh, obscurity that if we don't overcome, we will be devastated again uh, with math scores also. Van Ayers, when are we having, or if, if there's a, a way to uniform that assessment so teachers know how their kids are doing so they can address it early? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, great question, Ms. Gray. So we have, um, there are a lot of assessments that we utilize um, formatively um, to, to measure our student growth. Um, and with iReady, 90% 90, 90 of our teachers utilize the diagnostic instrument with iReady. So this instrument, we believe, um, is something that our teachers need to continue to utilize for this upcoming school year. Yes. Yeah, okay. Ms. Bregman, if you want to jump on anything with any part of details. And dibbles and yeah. you might want to comment? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely correct. There are a lot of ways you can assess a, assess a student. You know, we do have obviously the start and the fast assessment um, as mandatory progress monitoring um, per the state. We did bring dibbles in um, as that screener. Not only does it have the dyslexia portion, but it also really drills down to those finite skills and literacy. Um, you know, iReady is an additional assessment, but again, it's about picking and choosing and also educating our teachers, right? What we've always done and what we have done, in fairness, that's what they know, iReady. We've done it in the past. Mm -hmm. Last year was our first year making it optional, but in fairness to them, we didn't, other than unit assessments and some of those other things, the dibbles in ELA wasn't here. We didn't have it last year, so the, what do you do? You fall back on what you know. Um, so a lot of it is also just kind of showing how the Dibbles assessment can be used, showing how it can really promote strong intervention and how it is also that, you know, that idea of screen to intervene. Find out who's struggling first, find out what their needs are, and dig into it. And where iReady fits into that, hopefully, you know, my future vision of iReady is that it fits into truly that instructional piece where it's that toolbox, where it's the small group lessons, where it's the alignment to the instructional guides, the alignment to the benchmarks in both ELA and math. So it's providing teachers data in terms of day-to-day -day instruction based on their needs for that tier two and tier three in intervention, as opposed to just seeing iReady as simply just an assessment program. Um, while the assessment tool, it does have you know things to it, but it does, there are other pieces to iReady. Um, and so this is year two. Um, we worked hard with the iReady team. We worked hard as a team you know, between ELA and math to really um, kind of change the look of it. And I think we saw a lot of increase in terms of teacher-directed lessons versus the path. Um, so kind of continuing that work, but making sure 
that teachers are comfortable with the assessment that's new this year so that they can administer with its success and see its value moving forward as well. I don't know if that answered the question. Well, always. I mean, you're very comprehensive. I, uh, I And I, I definitely agree. I mean, as a former teacher, that the teachers should choose their assessment, but, but we the I ready was mandatory. But I also, you know, want that kind of confidence that, yes, we can catch the intervention, do these interventions before the test. I'm just being pragmatic. Uh, you know, it's it's so detrimental to see reading scores that are so low and schools that are still suffering the disparity of a low literacy rate. Um, and I'm, I'm just hoping that we are doing everything we can. Uh, and, and Van Ayers, just as a point of um, confidence, I, I would expect any teacher um, would have the better way of assessing and the more freedom they have, the better it is. There's no question just as long as we can hopefully raise those scores. Enough said. Thank you, Ms. Berkman. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member Gray. Member Vaughn. Thank you. Um, I don't have questions because Ms. Bergman and I have talked about I already <laughs> at nauseum at length, um, and I have all my questions answered. I do agree with, um, with Member Gray that reading is imperative. It's something that we absolutely have to focus on this year. It, is the core of education being able to read. Um, so I look forward to a lot of robust conversations as a board in this new year of what we're doing to address our reading readiness rates. I don't love iReady. I've never loved iReady. I don't love it as an educator. I don't love it as a parent. My son absolutely loathes it. Um, most of his classmates do as well. And I understand that we've used it optionally, but again, that hasn't always translated and there's still a lot of iReady homework and a lot of iReady use. And as we can see, it's not really giving us gains. I do understand that our teachers rely on that and need that, but when it was connected to our assessments and it could predict how our students were gonna do in our standardized tests, I saw more value in it. But as Member Gray has pointed out, especially with a lot of other options as far as assessing where our students are per personally as teachers with the new Dibbles rollout because my understanding from Dibbles, although we were using it as a screener, we were also using it as that piece for an assessment with a price tag for $4 million, especially when that's a quarter of what our negotiated salary raises of what we were looking at last year. And I know they're different categoricals, so it's not the same bucket of money, but to talk about that price tag in relationship to our budget, I just don't see the value in it for what we get out of it, even though I know our teachers really have relied on it. There have been so many other ways that we've pushed them to try new programs that I think that we've seen more um, progress from. So I just, I know it's not a surprise to most people who know, but I'm not going to support this item and I'm going to vote no. And I just wanted to kind of make clear my thought process is on already. So thank you. Can I add something just to that real quick? Um, just also just thinking, you know, you mentioned the connection between the assessments and between iReady. Just know that there is still the linking study in place. They are working on connecting. It's obviously fast as new. So for teachers that do give the diagnostic with fidelity, there is going to be that correlation. They will be able to show that data kind of over time and show the trajectory, um, you know, from first grade to third grade and things like that. Has, like every assessment, every assessment has a limitation, right? Um, but I did want to point out that there is still going to be, obviously with that new assessment, it, it does take a little bit of time to correlate it and measure it out, especially when standard setting is happening this week at the state level. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Um, and thank you, uh, Ms. Bergman, for giving us so much information and, and meeting with us. One of my biggest concern, really, even when I was elected was the amount of testing that's coming down from the Department of Education. And now we're starting to test students at a younger age. So it was at third grade. As someone who's either ran an after school tutoring program or owned a tutoring center, I am very familiar with iReady and when those scores come and the reaction of the parents. So my biggest thing is when I met with iReady last year and I talked to them in great length, I really talked about having an adaptable test. When a child goes in into third grade, they start taking that test and adapts them to a certain level. The idea of another test is, you know, and they said they were working on it. Obviously, they haven't 
come to that point. So this is my last year that I could support this because I think at the end of the day, we are testing our students far too much, but I don't want to take something away that 90% of our teachers are using, that 90% of our, our teachers are used last year. I'd like to see a survey. I'd like to see a survey. You provide a survey, not just about the use, but if they really would, if they had something else, would they use something else and what that would look like? I'd like to be proactive and get ready this year to kind of imagine um, fading that out for the following year. For the idea for a child to take FAST, to take Dibbles, and to take iReady, I just think is too much. And I really encourage our teachers to use it as a resource tool. And to, if they can, I think teachers who maybe don't have a lot of experience and maybe need more of that knowledge, maybe they would use iReady. But those teachers who have experience and they know what they're doing and they feel like the Dibbles is enough, I, I would encourage that. And I would encourage principals to understand that to really allow our teachers to be the experts and to really stop testing our students so much. So I am going to support this, but this is the last year and I want iReady to know that I was hoping for that change, but I haven't heard anything and I'm hoping to hear something soon. Thank you. Thank you. Member Rendon? Yeah, I, I, you know, I want to give some clarification to this. Um, it's, a, it's a complete toolbox. This is not just a new assessment, right? That is correct. Um, <laughs> iReady has multiple layers to it. It has the diagnostic. It has the teacher toolbox, which provides um, paper, pencil, for lack of better word, lessons and access to the magnetic reading if schools don't purchase it or not every teacher uses it. Um, it also has the scaffolded comprehension. It has the fluency piece on the math side. Um, in addition, it also does the instructional groupings. If students have taken a diagnostic, it'll put them into the instructional groups. Then you can link it to specific small group lessons that are not on the computer, as well as the teacher directed lessons you know, you can change their path or adjust their path as needed. So it has a lot of different options, not just a one size fits all for an assessment. Correct. And then on top of that, we're getting real time data, right? We're seeing that progression, not just once a quarter or over the fast test, but we're getting real time data for the frequency a child gets involved, the actual assessments, the actual diagnosis of individualist, you know, work that they're doing on specific key skills. So it's not just an assessment that they're sitting down, taking assessment, we analyze the data, we move on. It's a comprehensive, full on teacher using, student using, parent seeing, everyone can be involved. And so I want to make sure we're clear on that, that this is not just another test we're giving. It is a large toolbox that incorporates even the, you know, the integral part of if a student is low on a specific skill, they're going to intrigue that and work through that, correct? Correct. Um, and one of the things that we worked on this year with changing kind of the navigation of iReady is just to that assessment tools. We work with them to make sure that we weren't just providing reports around time on task, 45 minutes a week, that we were actually providing the reports on A, the teacher directed versus the personalized instruction, um, especially in mathematics. Um, and then the other part is also just looking time on task that students take to complete the lessons. In other words, are they blowing through them because they're just not, you know, that's what kids do. And then what percent of the students are actually getting that 70% on those lessons so that we can do it? And um, we worked with IT, we worked with a pilot group of principals in schools on emails and things like that to communicate that to teachers to try to bring that heightened awareness. Um, for the monitoring piece of their students on iReady. So we did kind of work with that and we'll continue to work with the iReady team and our IT department to continue that. Well, and I also want to make sure that we understand that, that this is, iReady is actually a recommendation of our DOE um, in preparation. It also addresses House Bill uh, 7039, um, Representative Trubolsky's bill, which increases reading and math skills in our early learning literacy. Um, so. I do want to thank you for bringing the detail to all of us and giving us the instructional. But, you know, I do I do support this, especially with the DOE coming in and about the specific diagnosis and working directly with Representative Trubolsky on exactly what her law is intended to do to bolster our students. Thank you. Thank you, Member Rendon. Member Hahn. Thank you, Member Combs. Um, I just wanted to add a few comments. I appreciate my colleagues' comments. Um, you know, certainly there's a lot of different types of tests that students have to take during their school years, formative, summative, standardized testing. And, you know, Member Combs is correct, you know, any, any type of uh, overuse of those tests can cause student fatigue, and we don't want that to happen. So, you know, I, I think that our 
our staff and superintendent know that you know this board is very much um, want to see a balance in those in those types of tests. Um, I will say, you know, wanting to sunset a certain type of assessment is something that we can further discuss. But I think, you know, to, to with everything that teachers are having to onboard in preparation for the school year, learning UFLY, learning Dibbles, um, you know, taking away iReady at this point would, um, I, I think, make teachers feel like they were a little bit on moving sand, you know, shifting sands, and to give them just a little bit of stability around you fly and dibbles for this year, or you know, this year would would build their confidence. And when their confidence is built around these new types of assessments, they'll lean into them more than maybe I ready and other types of assessments. So I think it is to, good to keep it in place, just so teachers feel like they have. Um, a lot of tools in their toolbox until they're comfortable and confident in the new tools that they're just learning about um, and getting used to using. I mean, this is the first time for probably a majority of our teachers using UFLY. Not everyone went to the University of Florida <laughs> or USF. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think um, the more confident they become in these other types of assessments, they'll utilize them more. And we probably will not see a high utilization rate of iReady um, next year uh, when you come back to us. That would be uh, what I would put my money on. Um, so anyway, thank you for um, all the time you've spent with each of us talking about this agenda item. Thank you, Member Hahn. Member Perez. So I, how long has the district had iReady? Um, based on what I have, I want to say it's been around for at least five, the last five years for sure, um, in terms of historical data. Um, so it's been around for quite a while. Um, it's widely used. So it has been in place. It's been here. I've been here three years and it's been here for that. It was here prior to me. So definitely for at least the last five years. So why do our students continue to struggle in transformation schools? You know, I think when you think about iReady, it is one tool. It is not the core instruction. It is not tier one. It provides data that can support that. But really and truly, when you look at teaching and you look at teaching and learning and curriculum and instruction, there's nothing that can replace that core instruction. There's nothing that can replace the explicit instruction that students need to know in terms of reading text, time on task, immediate feedback, student ownership of learning. All of those things are critical. iReady is one small component. So, you know, to put every, you know, to put all the eggs in the iReady basket um, and to say that the program itself is going to, you know, fix the world, that's not true. It's got to fit into the block and into, you know, literacy as a whole. So I, I think the problem goes way, you know, when you think about that and you dig down into the root cause analysis, you know, in terms of scores and things like that, I think, you know, iReady is not, you know, you're going to get deeper than just a program and kind of see that iReady is just plays a piece in, in, the, in the overall picture in terms of reading instruction. So when we have students that have been in our, per, in our schools since kindergarten and they're failing in third grade, they're failing in fifth grade, I ready has not prepared them. Um, so we're talking about transformation schools that really need to be lifted, and our students do not have the capability or the equipment to be able to utilize I ready, and they're the ones who really need this program. Am I correct? That is correct, although I would probably defer to transformation for more of the additional resources and things like that that they're providing instructionally. Because again, they, they do a wonderful job in supporting and being responsive to the data. Well, I'm not, uh, I'm not speaking about in the school, but the children need to yes. be able to um, um, utilize this program at home to be able to support their work at school. Right? Correct, it's definitely an option, okay. yes. All right, that's, that's all I need, thank you. Thank you. Um, Member Press, Member Washington. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what what is the difference, you know, between uh, doubles and I ready? So while both may be considered that diagnostic piece, um, you know, when you look at I ready, I ready is going to first of all, I ready is computerized, so kids don't read into it. It's either listening or they read 
with it. Um, so it's, you know, and it does adapt to a point only to certain levels in certain areas, depending on the grade level of the student. So it'll give that big picture of where students are, where students are struggling in terms of grade level benchmark, you know, yeah, et cetera, et cetera, and kind of say yay, nay um, in terms of meeting those expectations. When you think about Dibbles, you're thinking about Dibbles as that piece where it is more, A, it's individual, so especially for our primary students, you know, it's that piece where I'm actually listening to the students read, and I'm actually going to get into, is there issue in phonics, and if so, where in phonics? It's going to get to that issue of, it's not just phonics, they, they're not doing well with nonsense word fluency, I got to dig deeper, and it lies in that phonemic segmentation and phonemic, you know, phonemic awareness skills, which is a different layer of instruction. You won't get that data from iReady. It just won't drill down to that. It's not designed for that. The other piece that iReady does not address in terms of literacy is the fluency piece. It can address fluency because it doesn't have a way, a mechanism to listen to kids read. So unless it knows it all, you know, it doesn't measure it. It measures the comprehension, it measures the vocabulary, it can measure the basic phonics. But when you're trying to make instructional decisions for kids, it does have an element that can be used, but it won't necessarily be able to say yay or nay, because you never heard the kid. So when you're looking at it again, it provides those different aspects, so it provides more of that global picture. But for student, for teachers rather, that aren't necessarily at that highly skilled level where they are struggling, you know, reading is hard to learn how to teach. And, you know, I know it's, it's that under, you know, misunderstood subject sometimes. It does provide a basis to guarantee that teachers do have enough data to at least start pulling their small groups and get those structures in as they learn the Dibbles piece. So it kind of, they, they, they can work hand in hand, they can work side by side, but they do both give different information. Okay, you, you know, I agree with one of my board members, but some, most of my board members, we, um, we need to have a survey, at least, you know, to find out what the teachers really like, because, you know, you give them a lot of options, and many times when you give people options, and one been in longer than the other, and they don't take the one that's been in the longest. So I would like to see a survey on that. But I'm going to support it, and the reason why I'm going to support it because I don't want to pull the rug from up under the teachers now, so they'll feel um, so they'll feel uncomfortable. So I'm going to support it. But I'm like mem uh, Madam Chair to be my last year supporting it. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely, and we will work to get that survey data in, especially as we begin to administer Dibbles. We'll also be taking some survey data on teachers and feedback on that um, implementation for UFLY and for the Dibbles assessment moving forward into this year. Oh, yeah. So we will yes, be more than happy to share with you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yep. Thank you, Member Washington. Member Vaughn? Thank you. Um, thank you for all the conversation. It, it made me really kind of think about and be able to articulate some of my concerns even and better. Um, as far as real-time data, I mean, that's essentially what our teachers are supposed to be trained to do, right? And although the science of reading is very challenging to gather some of the similar data and just place kids in guiding reading groups, you can do a running record. And as you mentioned, it's going to be more effective in being able to understand the fluency and see the, you know, how they pronounce the phonics. Doing something on the computer, and we've had this conversation several times, kids learn to game it, right? I've seen them just look at the first three letters of the word and guess what it is because it's been so routine, like a, a, like a video game. And when you pull them actually back to a guided reading table, they do really well on their iReady assessment, but then there's absolutely no fluency and they can't even pronounce the phonetic sounds. So there is a huge disconnect from what you see when you're placing your kids and they're taking the assessment on a computer and when you actually have them come to your table and to read. And that's been one of my, my biggest concerns. So you can get real-time data as an educator by interacting with your students and having them reading to you and doing running records and using the old paper and pencil way of actually evaluating how your students are reading and that's actually going to be more effective than a program that kids are, are interfacing with as opposed to the educator so that's one of my concerns which I said many times and I do appreciate that my fellow board members are concerned about the fact of giving teachers less tool in a time of transition. But I went back and I watched our board meeting last year and we all had a similar conversation. And in fact, I asked for a survey and that's one of the reasons that we kept it, but we acted like that was gonna be the last year using it and we were gonna transition to other things. So I guess what I'm wondering is, 
is were we anticipating transitioning to other skills because we said we're just going to give them this tool set because they've been so used to it and then we're going to find something else and then dibbles was rolled out later and we're kind of evaluating whether they've had enough time to transition to that and is that why we're thinking of another year or it just feels like we're having the same conversation every year and i'm wondering what's going to be different next year so I think um, I can answer that just from perspective, right? Like, first of all, I already was always seen as that assessment piece. I think if you watched the board meeting last year, I believe it was the assessment office that actually brought the item, not curriculum and instruction, which is a little different, right? I, I'm definitely not the assessment office. Um, and so I think one of the reasons, A, I think it is true, right? You can't take something away from teachers without giving something that they're comfortable with and giving them enough advance notice and that input, which, you know, as we rolled in, we had the input for UFLY, we had the input for Dibbles and the need for that with statute, but it's also a lot for them to learn. So I think that is why as a curriculum and instruction side, we chose to keep it for that one more year. Um, and really, at least in ELA, right, because um, that's what I represent at the moment. Um, and so we are looking at, you know, I can't, so we're also looking at different ways then that we can utilize that data and really making sure that we can show teachers how to intervene appropriately. Because again, I already has more than just the assessment. So whether they use the toolbox lessons, that's another piece of data that we have to capture. Um, because that's the other side of iReady. And again, you take that away, then you've now also, in some cases, taken away their small group instruction. Um, and I know, you know, this is where I can speak to math, um, you know, that they use it on both sides, you know, when you think about that. So I think that's the other side of it, is that from the instructional side, when you look at 700,000 lessons that are teacher-directed, and also the personalized path, they are also engaging in the lesson side. So we want to see is there that correlation if they really know more about the students and doing that. But, um, you know, for us, it's also about taking, looking at it from the curriculum instruction side a little bit more this year and really looking carefully at it. Um, we are prepared to start bringing teachers together and having those conversations, um, just like we did with Dibbles this year and moving forward. Well, I appreciate that. I'm still not going to support the item. <laughs> I have a feeling it's gonna I have a feeling it's gonna pass my only question would be is if it passes I know you say like we've tried to break away from because it feels like when it was rolled out it was the mandatory so long on iReady and that even though we're rolling out information about how to use it as a more robust teaching tool and with all these lessons for a good portion of it teachers are just wrote and that's what they're used to and they still have a mandatory time that kids have to sit on iReady and like my son comes home and he even talks now about like, wow, one of my friends doesn't have a computer at home. And so he has to spend extra time on recess to make his I ready out, you know, minutes. And there's still that piece of inequity that we always talk about. And that member Perez has brought up because it is computer accessible. So, you know, at, if it passes again tonight, and we continue using this again, what I would hope for is that we get the way the word out to use it in an appropriate way so that it is engaging and it is interactive and it's not just teachers assigning 90 minutes of iReady every week and that also again we find a way to address that inequity because if it's just being used as assessment and teacher lesson it shouldn't matter if a kid doesn't have it on home they shouldn't have to give up their recess or time for something else to get in their iReady minutes and I've been seeing that still even though we have continued conversations so if we can do a better job about making sure it's utilized correctly I'd appreciate that. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that feedback because that was one of our goals this year was to take away the monitoring of that 45 minutes and 90 minutes and all of those things and really focus on the instruction. So we'll continue with the messaging. I do think um, administrators as well, as they learn more about the assessments, are going to start asking questions too. We've already had quite a few. Um, and so, you know, like I said, moving forward, thinking more critically about IREADY and its place here in Hillsborough County. Uh, th thank you, Member Vaughn. I I'm not going to repeat some of the things that I said, but the, the main thing is I think that there are, we do have a lot of programs like that. We have achieved 3,000. It's not like there's so many free programs. There's a ton of different computer programs. What I'd like to see at you know, some point, I'd love to see, you know, and I've talked about this in the past, all the different programs that we have, like Achieve 3000, all the other programs, and how much are they being used? What does that look like? You know, so that way we can see, you know, what we're going to use, what we're not going to use, because nothing is going to replace that individual instruction. Or like for me, having a tutoring center for so many years, I ready was, you know, was just 
close, but not close. Because like uh, Member Vaughn said, I couldn't check the fluency. I couldn't check the writing. There were so many factors. And it was just one little piece of that puzzle. But if that child has five pieces of the puzzle to see where they are, and they're being told, like you have a first, a third grader being told in Dibbles, you're below level. Then you're an I ready. You're below level. Then fast. You're below level. I mean, how many times can you tell a child that they're below level and give them data and scores to take home and their parents look at that? And how does that child feel in the end? And who you think you are is who you become. So there's got to be a point where we're really doing the surveying early, like starting, you know, after the first nine weeks. Do you feel like there was a excessive testing for your child, for your children in your classroom? How much time did that take you? Did you get an accurate picture. Let's move towards, you know, kind of sunsetting iReady because I think teachers love iReady because they don't know anything else and it's something that they can rely on. So I really would like to see us kind of moving towards away from that. So, um, and then the other program, as far as inequities, I know a lot of principals work very hard at opening their campus before or after and trying to give access to make sure that they have computers and that is not like children aren't losing, losing electives. I haven't heard that in any of my schools where a child is losing time outside or doing something like that. Sometimes parents do want the children to go in. They don't have access to iReady, but I haven't really heard that from any of my schools where um, principals are keeping kids away from different events for that. So I, I think that's kind of important. I wanted to mention that as well. But I'm going to support this, but I want to see kind of an exit strategy or I want to see the teachers feel like this is so important that they want to keep it and then I will support that. Thank you. Um, Member Gray? Yes, and uh, Ms. Bergman, I hope these conversations are helping give you directions um, because we're we're really floating around better ways of um, assessing our children and their reading ability. I agree, uh, Member Combs, the actual fidelity of the iReady, it's always been an easier diagnostic tool than the actual test. It's always been easy, and the Achieve 3000 was one of the best ones, according to teachers. And Van, I think you remember when we had the principals meeting, the principals told us that the teachers loved iReady. It was last year, they, I mean, the hands went up, and I can't remember if you were there or not, but it was uh, Superintendent Davis, but the, t uh, the principals were all buying in. My question is, and not really a question, Ms. Bergman, but my uh, concern is the relevancy. So when I say I agree with Member Combs um, one more year, or Member Washington, it's because the test in the curriculum has changed. ELA, ELA curriculum has changed. So has the math curriculum has changed. And then you have to wonder how, how relevant is that testing? Are they keeping up? So why this expenditure? If you remember, we, I read it cost us a pretty penny and I said no to it. And, and Deb Pepe remembers you got mad at me because I didn't want to spend that money. Um, so, you know, this is a lot of, a lot of monetary cash, which means the board has every right to ask these sophisticated questions. Um, also, any diagnostic test, and this is from teacher land, anything that we test, teacher made tests, dibbles, it's only as good as the teacher. Because if the teacher is not effective, that intervention process doesn't occur. So all of these assessments are only as good as the effective teacher, and that's what I, it comes right back down to. So I have no other suggestion. I'm going to support it because, you know, most of the teachers really want this, and obviously we had a 90% yes. Um, it's a lot of money. Um, but I, I definitely think the board, uh, you're hearing from the board that we would like to see something more solid uh, or relevant. For me, the word's relevant. Perhaps they have other words. But um, uh, thank you for listening. And also, member, I mean, Ms. Pepe, I have shared that we did do an audit on all reading materials. I don't know what happened to that audit, but that would be very helpful for school board members to see everything that was effective, inclusive of the diagnostic tests, I think that would be important to be shared. Yeah. 
can't speak from the audience. If you oh. need to say something, it needs to be on the, in the, on the record. So on behalf of Ms. Pepe, we'll make sure that you guys get that if you haven't gotten it. <laughs> She's coming. Hello. Hi. Uh, yes, that was part of the literacy audit that we had prior to Superintendent uh, Davis. Um, with that audit, that was sent to all board members at that time, and I know that was a transition period in December. I can resend all of that information. It was basically the cohesiveness of what we're doing with instruction um, and also the assessment piece of that and how they matched, and that's why we had that consistency of, with iReady at the time. Um, so that continues to be the tool, just listening to the conversation, and yes, and that point in time in, in – um, in the district, we didn't have a consistent measure because we had a lot of different tools being used and we didn't have one consistency across the board for that piece. Um, so just looking at the board agenda item, talking to Tracy and looking at these piece, pieces with the teachers wanting that assessment, um, but also that knowing that it's embedded into curriculum guides at this point and looking at how and programs work and doing full evaluations, which our department obviously does as well. So we will make sure that we have full evaluations done on programs as well. Yep. Thank you, Ms. Pepe. Of course. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member Wright. Member Hahn. Thank you, Member Combs. Um, just a, f a few more things following up on some of the comments. You know, um, the closer we can get to doing more individualized one-on-one -on -one assessments, obviously we can be more effective in closing that achievement gap. And that's why, you know, when you talk about dibbles, there's so much about that that I really like. Um, I think one of the things that we struggle with, though, because of what's happening in education is obviously our unstable teacher workforce. Mm -hmm. So we, pro I mean, we could have as high as 50% of our teachers who have never gone through a teacher preparation program and really learned how to assess, utilize the data from the assessment, and then figure out how to use that to drive their instruction. We have subs coming in and out of some of our most vulnerable classrooms, right, that you always talk about. And, um, you know, again, I think that's why a lot of the teachers, some of them, you know, fall back on iReady because it doesn't, you know, take the amount of intense training as some of these other types of assessment tools. So that worries me, you know, when we've got such an unstable workforce and we've got teachers coming in and out, you know, we need something that these subs can go to and, and get some data. Um, you know, though, and, and as far as like the silver bullet, this is by far not the silver bullet to fix our literacy issues. <laughs> um, um, I'm going to just go back on my soapbox and say access and equity to high quality early education programs is what's going to really help students get a good start and a strong finish in their quick K-12 careers. And we have students, you know, and, and lots of confounding variables that we can't control that impact student academic achievement, the biggest one being poverty and lack of access and opportunity. And, you know, I, you know, when you hear stories of students who are being enrolled in kindergarten in January, and now they have missed an entire year of kindergarten, and they have never been to preschool, they don't know their letters, their numbers, and they've got a few, like half the school year now to, to learn how to basically read, <laughs> you, that is going to be an achievement gap that's going to exist for that student for many years, unfortunately. And, um, you know, iReady isn't going to fix that. That's not what it's for. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I know we've been talking about just like, you know, what, how are we going to move that literacy needle? And, and it's really a strong start. But for kids who are, you know, don't get that strong start, it's having teachers who understand how to give assessments that really dig down to the individualized reading issues, know how to use the data to drive their instruction. And that's how we're going to start moving that needle. And that takes, at the very basic foundation, a stable teacher workforce okay. so that we're not continually training, 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 the more stable your teacher workforce and really good relationships with your teacher preparation programs so that who's, who's teaching future teachers, they understand the types of tools and instruments and knowledge they need to face the challenges that exist 
in an urban school district like Hillsborough County. So thank you. Thank you, Member Hahn. Member Prez? So I'm going to give this example. I'm going to give this example and then I'm going to leave it here. You know, um, Superintendent Ayers, um, I, in our, in our meeting last week, I showed you a picture that a fifth grader drew for me. So I have a therapy dog. I don't have a therapy dog. He works for me. And I brought him with me to a camp and a fifth grader who actually stood a little taller than me drew a picture. She was so proud. She drew a picture of Baxter, little tiny Baxter. And she wrote his name across the top of this picture. Baxter is spelled B-A-X-T-E-R. And she wrote his name B-A-C-K-S-T-E-R. And she was so proud of herself. Fifth grader. And I asked her if I could keep the picture. And I have the picture at home in my refrigerator. Not in, on. And I realized every day I'm looking at that picture that no matter the tools that we have in our classrooms, that we continue to fail our students if the work does not follow our students home. Um, and our students are ill-equipped to engage in their own education, accessing the path to their future. So we have to be able to equip these students to be able to engage in their, their education at home as they do in the classroom. We have to. Because now this is a fifth grader and she's going into the sixth grade starting next week or the week after. So we have to do better. We've got to do better. Thank you. Thank you, Member Press. Member Vaughn. Thank you. I wasn't going to comment again because we've had a lot of discussion about this. Um, but I just wanted to say I hear your point, Dr. Hahn, and as someone who's been a substitute teacher, sometimes long term, sometimes short, I understand I had an education background, so it was easier for me. But I guess my point is, is if we are going to use it more as a supplemental tool for our unsteady workforce, I think we could find a program that's less intensive that doesn't cost as much. For me, I understand the value of what you're saying, and I do think we need tools to support uh, many of the people in our classrooms who don't have necessarily that educational background. But for me, to spend $4 million to do that, I feel like we could find a tool that would, if that's the way we're going to use it, that wouldn't be as expensive. The, the value that I hear in it is that it has a so whole suite of other things that we can use it for that I'm not sure if it's our kind of untrained staff if they're going to be able to use it for that value so that's where I still kind of struggle with the price point on it um, and I do appreciate member comes that you haven't had the experience of people not being able to move on to some of the other things in their day through their eye ready I never said that that was coming out of principles um, I said that was the experience that I'm seeing from my classmates of the uh, in, in my son's school so a lot of times that information comes from having students or from your students I, I didn't say that there were administrators or teachers who were telling me that so it might not be something that you see unless you're in the classroom or you have students who are in the classroom so I just want to follow up to make sure that you didn't think I said administrators were putting those memos out or that's where I was hearing that from so I just want to follow up with a few points on that but I think this has been a really good conversation and that we're kind of all leading in the same area we may disagree on exactly what the changes we make, but I think that we all say that we think literary, you know, literacy is important. We want to focus on that and that hopefully if we're not going to use this next year, we'll find something that will be a good resource for our, our teachers and help move the needle as well. So thank you so much for all this discussion. Yes, great discussion. Board members, please vote when your lights appear. Oh, <laughs> And it does not pass unanimously. It's gonna. It's, it's six votes. You wanted to know, right? I mean, I wanted to know. Yeah, so okay, so six. If, if you yes. Could, that was a mistake. mistake. So it's six. If we could, let's let's reset and vote again. See, I convinced you because you were thinking about the principal thing, right? Okay, ready, board members. Please vote when your lights appear.
Okay, and it passes five to two with um, board member Vaughn and member Perez voting no. Um, you have, Madam Chair, you have three minutes, so maybe you want to do one more item. Yes, instead. one more item, and then uh, that's, then we'll do the time certain item. Okay, 301, um, sole source 230102 SSDSK purchase of preschool curriculum kits and training from Frog Street Press, LLC. Superintendent Ayers will highlight this item. Thank you, Chair Combs. Uh, this curriculum meets the identified needs of pre-K teachers and school leaders through a strength-based approach to meet diverse needs and developmental levels in preschool classes that aligns to the science of reading, oral language development, lis listening comprehension, phonological awareness, motivation, and engagement, thinking and reasoning, storytelling, and content knowledge. Frog Street includes a unique science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics STEAM component with weekly explorations that build students' understanding of higher order thinking skills skills and the application of content knowledge. Lisa Haynes, Supervisor of Early Childhood Education. Uh, Tracy Brown, myself, are here if there are any other questions related to 301. Thank you. Thank you. I need a motion and a second to adopt item C, 301. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Vaughn. Member Vaughn, you pull this item. Do you have any questions or comments? Thank you. Um, no, I had similar concerns as I did um, about iReady, just another computer program and personal, I mean, professional development. And honestly, I was set to vote no, but Ms. Haynes, Hayes, Haynes, Hayes? Haynes, help me understand the value of this, and I'm actually really excited about this, so thank you so much for your time, um, and I'm, I'm actually ready to vote yes on this, so thank you. Okay. Board members, please vote when your lights appear. I think we, I think we can go. And it passes unanimously. Okay, we will go ahead and we will now move to our time certain items. And we have two policies or recognitions or recommended materials. Public two public hearings, okay. So we'll start with FO1, which is the public hearing for recommended instructional materials for agriculture, food, and natural resources. I will now open the public hearing for the instructional materials adoption process. This is a requirement pursuant to state law and board policy. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to speak about the instructional materials that are recommended for adoption by the board and provide input to the board. The materials were advertised and have been available for public view. I will now ask Debbie Deborah Pepe, Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and Learning, to present this item. After her presentation, any member of the public may speak to provide input to the board on the proposed instructional materials. Thank you. Good afternoon, school board chair, board members, superintendent, and staff. At this time, the board is conducting a public hearing on instructional materials being recommended for adoption. The list of materials is attached to the agenda item and includes materials for agriculture, food, and natural resources. These materials have been reviewed by a district adoption committee and are being recommended for adoption. As required by state statute, a 20-day public review of recommended materials and a public hearing is required before the board can vote for the adoption. The public review requires that the district provide digital access to the recommended materials via the district website. The public review was conducted beginning on July 5th, 2023 and ending on July 25th, 2023. The public hearing this evening is to provide the opportunity for community members to share comments about these materials with the board. The board does not need to take action at this time, but will be asked to vote at the next regular scheduled board meeting, August 8th, 2023. At this time, you may call for public comments. Do we have anyone signed up in the public hearing for the adoption of the instructional materials? Do we have anyone who'd like to speak? Okay, okay. okay I will now close the public hearing. There's I will no now, vote required. At this there's point. no vote. I will now close the public hearing. Okay, was he gonna speak? Okay, go ahead and speak. I know you'd like to speak. Go ahead and speak. Yeah, I want to speak because you aren't following law. 
Are you speaking about the curriculum that's being adopted? No, yeah, it's just specifically about the instructional budget agricultural the materials. The budget hearing. For, yeah, it's the bubble. The hearing is supposed to be a 501. It that's be the law. 501. It's now 503, and we're going into the budget hearing. And so if you take your seat, you'll be allowed to speak when it's public comment Follow time. the law. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clutho. So what we'll do is we'll finish, we'll close this. I will now close this public hearing and we'll continue with the next one. I think that will give you an opportunity to speak at that time. Okay, so we have concluded now zero two, the first public hearing on the millage rates and tentative budget for 23-2024 fiscal year. School board members, we present to you in our community the 2023-2024 millage rates and proposed tentative budget, also known as the first public hearing for the millage rates and the budget. Our budget includes all government and proprietary funds of the district and the proposed tax rate. Please adjourn the regular school board meeting and open the public hearing on the tentative millage rates and budget. We will close the regular school board meeting and open the public hearing for the millage rates and tentative budget for fiscal year 2023-2024. Ms. Johnson? Good evening, board members, chair, and superintendent. It is recommended that the board adopt the tentative state required local effort millage rate of 3.1520 mills. It is recommended that the board adopt the discretionary operation millage rate of 0 0.7480 mills. It is recommended that the board adopt the local capital improvement millage rate of 1.5000 mills. And it is recommended that the board adopt the debt service millage rate of 0, 0.00 mills. Thank you. May I have a motion a second to adopt the fiscal year 2023-2024 tentative, tentative millage rates as presented. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Gray. Is there anyone present who wishes to address the board concerning the proposed millage rates or rolled back rate? Mark Clutho Largo. Well, I have to say again, it's ass backwards that you're doing this according to law. The millage before you do the budget. But uh, you know, this is money wasted and you know, as I see you all sitting up there drinking water from your little bottles that take more water to make than they hold. You know, it makes me question whether you could make a decision about what kind of millage would be the reasonable amount. Could you make a right decision? You see me with my jug that was originally purchased 826 of last year that's being refilled at the machine over and over again, which will eventually be recycled. All of you make sure those little water bottles are recycled, I'm sure. But You know, when I'm looking at $250,242,000 for capital outlays, I just can't see this increase. You people don't have the wherewithal to be making wise decisions. 
And of course, when we, we get to this, more to come. Thank you. Is there anyone present who wishes, oh, we already did that. School board members, do you have any questions or comments? Okay. Member Gray? <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Romanier, a question to you. This is regarding the millage rates. When I'm looking at the, uh, the year 22 to 23, I see 5.8470. And then on the following year, 23 through 24, it's 5.4, which is lower. Um, can you go ahead and share the uh, the fiscal um, reality that this lower millage rate will impair or affect our uh, fund balance. Okay, this is, um, well, our rollback rate is 3.0068. So if we wanted to collect the same resource as last year, the state, we, this is a tax increase. So taxes will go up a little bit based on our new rate that the um, state adopted. It will impact taxpayers. But so there's definitely a tax increase. Well, I'm talking about our district. Our we district, but we're receiving district revenue because we have got an increase in overall in our taxes from 57 million in our local resources has increased to the district. Okay, even though the millage rate is lower, from it, what I'm seeing Because the here. rollback rate is lower than the actual local effort rate. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're about the same then? Are you, and if we wanted to get the same amount of resources to come in, we would have to lower our local effort rate to 3.0068. But it's indeed our um, local effort rate is 3.1520. So that's a tax increase. So we're getting more resource from local. Okay, okay. Well, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my brain around that. But, uh, yeah, it would look at first sight that this is a lower amount and uh, possibly translate into a lower amount. of uh, Because our taxable value would increase. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Member Gray. Member Vaughn. Thank you. Can you explain the rollback piece of this when you say the rollback rate is increasing? Uh, the rollback rate is, is less than our local effort rate, which mean that if the state took the rollback rate, we will be collecting the same amount of resource for the fiscal year. But since our rollback rate is less, we're, we're collecting more. So it's a tax increase for the taxpayer. But can you explain to the people listening what a rollback rate is, what rollback means in terms of the, le the millage that we're levying? Well, if we roll back, that means that the opportunity for the public to say they want to go to the rollback rate means that we will be collecting less tax money for the school district. And the state will be collecting less levying taxes against the taxpayer, the public. So how does that correspond to the cap that we have from the state that they implemented with the amount? Because price assessed value is going up, right? Does that mean that we're automatically going to get as much as the value inflates and as much as taxes go up and as much as that we get the full amount of that income coming in? Or is there a cap on that? 3% cap. 3% cap. Mm -hmm. So regardless of whether home rates go up, because we have this conversation all the time, <laughs> and Member Snively always has a different understanding of it. So regardless of whether, let's say, we're living in a booming area and the price of, of value is going up, as we see happening here in Florida, especially here in Tampa, a lot of people, and the reason I'm having this conversation, automatically think that means, well, then our schools are getting more taxes and they're going to have a bunch of money. And because house prices are going up, the percentage that they're taking is going to go up. They don't understand that there is an, a, a statewide cap. That means regardless of how much we, we bring in, if we oversee a certain amount, the, ta the state takes that, right, and redisperses it because you can only you can only take in a certain amount of taxes regardless of what our rate is or regardless of how much inflation happens. Am That's I explaining correct. that correctly? Right. The state um, does the total collection. So if any increase in local is coming down off the state allocation appropriation. So it's a, a relationship that if state goes up, the local goes down. If local goes up, 
state comes down. Okay, I just want to be clear on that so people understand because again, in the, in the general public, a lot of conversation I have as we talk about our finances and we talk about revenue and what comes in is they assume that because the market is very high right now and because people are paying a lot of high homestead taxes that that equates to money coming directly to the school district. And I just want to be clear on this that it doesn't because there is an additional cap, which means we can only collect so much before either the state takes it or they give it back. I'm, I'm still very confused about what happens when we reach that cap, but that does not mean that our revenue is increasing exponentially. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Hahn. Thank you, Member Combs. But even though it's capped and the rollback, we're still getting $57 million more. Yes, but the state, uh, this, this bucket of money, the state collects a certain amount. It, depending if they want to increase resources to the school district, they decide how they're going to allocate these resources to the school district. So we are participating in the Florida um, allocation model. So definitely we might collect more local, but the state has state resources they allocate to us. They take the reductions in our categoricals or our allocation based on our per pupil. So is that $57 million going to the state and they're allocating it out? Yes, the state decides when they want to increase taxes, they'll they'll increase the tax by participating in FEFP. That's why all school districts have okay. to participate in it. Right. And the based on the amount they are planning to collect, right. that is allocated to the school district across the board. But they adjust their the their allocation of the appropriation to us based on the local the amount we collect on our local taxes. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the clarification. It helps. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Member Gray? Yeah, it is a confusing um, data point. I'll just put financial data point. Uh, the question is, when we talk about rates, did you get the numbers, the new rate, uh, the new rates from the state yet? Are we still? Yes, these are the, um, the numbers from these the state. Are the, so then from this, you establish your tentative budget. Is that accurate? Correct. And this tentative is subject to change because we're still closing our financial books also. Subject to change how much? Are we talking millions? Are um, we, just we don't know exactly, but it's hard to say at this time. Okay. Because okay. we're still in the process of doing fiscal year close. Okay. Oh, we're not, yeah, we haven't closed the year yet. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gray. Board members, please vote when your lights appear. Okay, and it passes unanimously. It is recommended the board approve the resolutions adopting the tentative millage rates and tentative budget. I need a motion. I'm, I'm just reading off the script. You skipped over. Um, we, we need the, the board adopt the tentative budget at this point. Okay. It, it is. It is recommended that the board right. adopt a tentative budget of three billion nine hundred ninety one million three hundred fifty thousand three hundred fifty four dollars and four cent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. I need a motion and a second to adopt the tentative budget. A motion by Member Washington, a second by Member Perez. Is there anyone present who wishes to address the board concerning the tentative budget? I think we have one person. Okay, Mr. Clutho. Mark Clutho Largo. Well, you people don't have any business speaking up there. School board member using the word exponentially. You don't know what that word means. What 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 that what was the exponent that you were speaking of? What exponent? What exponent? Increasing by what exponent? There has to be one. You can't just say exponentially. 
without without it a specific exponent you can't be up here and just throw words out into the air exponentially means something okay mr Clutha, this is a public hearing this is not that's right public. that's right you're here to talk about the budget and, and i am you're not so you need to focus on the budget I am. Sp <laughs> you don't want me to bring the lawyer in here. I welcome an opportunity to talk to your lawyer. He's a good guy. Yeah. <laughs> but don't tell me when I'm addressing this issue of what your board members are saying isn't addressing this budget. These are the very words they're using. Oh, man. School board. $2,410,000. General administration, $19,000,000. Operation of plan, $166 million. I'll tell you. <laughs> this is just a debacle. You know, and I, as, like I say, over 30 years. High performance passive solar building. There's a saying, penny wise, pound foolish. Thank you very much. Thank you. School board members, do you have any questions or comments? Me Member Ray? <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Romanier, just a few questions regarding the tentative budget. Um, as shown on the page that you shared with me, when we look at the 71, let's just round it off, $72 million figure, which um, is corresponding to the financial position before reoccurring salaries and other AP accruals, the $72 million does that reflect, and I know this is the uh, end of the year budget, but does that reflect the FTE loss from charter schools from the public school? Well, we haven't gone too much into the public schools yet. I mean, the private schools, excuse me, from the home school. Uh, does that reflect also the 15 million, which, well, that will be next year. But what I want to know is how reflective is that figure? Uh, does it include transportation? Um, the charter FTE, the homeschool FTE, and if there are a few that did tra uh, change to private school, which I, I don't think, but uh, actually I do think, I think we had 66 kids. Uh, what does that include? Okay, that's our financial position before well, we're closing out the fiscal year. So that this spreadsheet reflects this current fiscal year that we're closing out, and that's showing you our financial position at this time. We do have um, reoccurring salaries that we're reducing that 71 million. And we also have payroll accruals of um, reoccurring salary around 25 million. We have payroll accruals around close to 10 million, 9.2 million on that sheet that we would be reducing that 71 million. And also we have also non reoccurring salaries that is gonna be reducing that from 12.5 million. That's just showing you where our financial position when we close out this fiscal year, where we're projecting to end. We're projecting that our total fund balance when we close this fiscal year are gonna be around 331 million. But does it include the yes. loss of if it does? It, everything is embedded in those numbers. Yes. Well, what I think we would like to see is what was included on a piece of paper so the board members Yes, I'll, I'll present that when we do the final that. hearing and we adopt the budget. When we close out this fiscal year, I'll do a detailed explanation of how we close out this fiscal year where we landed. This is just a high level showing you that 
this $331 million, how we got to that in our tentative budget, which is going to change. We still got, this is a projection, it's not the final. So when we get to the final, we'll be presenting that before the board, before we adopt the budget for the next fiscal year, which is coming in September. And, and as I requested two months ago, I would like a monthly uh, report on the FTE loss for charters, FTE loss for the um, private schools and the home school. Um, and I think that's very important as we move forward with a fund balance that may be starting to go lower, um, kind of keeping the pulse on our financial status. Um, and as we go through the changes for next year, we are reminded that we will not have ESSER three grant money. Is that correct? We have a small amount of ESSER three. We will be moving salaries to around forty-seven million at this time. That we'll be removing general fund salaries to ESSER three to finalize that grant. So we have one more year of ESSER. Right. It closed September twenty twenty-four. Correct. But we can use it for instruction. I didn't think we could. We, we still will be moving salaries. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, so, yeah, that's my ask, and I know that uh, hopefully you took it seriously because I, I definitely think as we merge into lower uh, fiscal, let's just say, monetary status in our district, because within a year we could be yeah, slowly so we're give draining. An update. When schools start, we'll start giving an update and give you all the financials and tracking charters when we, if we're gaining students. Alone. Not only charters, but homeschool yep, and, and all also those. private school. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Member Gray. Member Vaughn? I just have one little question. It's a little one. What percentage of our fund balance is that when we're ending up with for the year close? The percentage? 20%. 20%. 20%. That's, that's what I thought you said. I wanted to make sure. I, that's it. That's the only question. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Board Member Vaughn. Okay. Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. It is recommended that the board approve the resolution adopting the tentative millage rates in a tentative budget. I need a motion second to approve the resolutions adopting the tentative millage rates and the tentative budget as presented. Motion by Member Washington, second by Member Gray. Is there anyone present who wishes to address the board concerning the tentative millage rates and tentative budget? School board members, do you have any questions or comments? Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. It is recommended that the board authorize staff to perform all tasks necessary to ensure compliance with the truth and millage requirements of Chapter 200 Florida statutes. I need a motion a second to authorize the staff to perform all tasks necessary to ensure compliance with the truth millage requirements of Chapter 200 Florida statutes as presented. I have a motion by Member Perez. I have a second by Member Gray. Is there anyone present who wishes to address the board concerning the authorization of staff to perform all the tasks necessary to ensure compliance with the truth and millage requirements of Chapter 200 Florida statutes? School board members, do you have any questions or comments? Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. We will now adjourn the first public hearing on the budget and reconvene the regular school board meeting, the final public hearing for the fiscal year 2023-2024 bud budget and millage rates will be held Thursday, September 7th, 2023 at 5.01 p.m. Okay, board members, we'll continue with our agenda. Our next agenda item will be 901, which will be the sole source purchase of 22191 SSDWA of Elevation at Platform for Curriculum Associates for the 2023-2024 school year. Superintendent Ayers will highlight this item. Thank you, Chair Combs. Um, HCPS has worked with Elevation since 2014 with a small number of pilot schools, and then ultimately went, we went district-wide in 2018. 
Elevation provides teachers with instructional strategies and activities to support our ELLs at all grade levels. Uh, Elevation also provides a platform to organize required ELL student documentation and provides multiple academic data points for all students, including the 24,265 current ELLs uh, and 8,248 former ELLs. Uh, this elevation is funded from Title III grant funds, 70%, and the remaining 30% is funded out of ESSER. Thank you. I need a motion and a second to approve item C901. I have a motion by Member Perez, and I have a second by Member Vaughn, Member Gray, and Member Rendon. You both pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? We'll start with, you want to start with Member Gray? Okay, we'll start with Member Gray. G before R. That makes sense. All right. Um, my question is, um, <clears throat> and I'm happy that this is good news, and I, I believe it will go to Ms. Salgado because uh, Elena is not here. Uh, Ms. Salgado, if you would do us the pleasure and uh, congratulations on your new post. Um, so we're very happy to have you. Uh, <clears throat> the, the question is, um, when we talk about grants, it's always good to know the metrics and how we're measuring the success uh, or the fidelity of how we did with the money so far. Um, our students, the ELL students, if I'm not mistaken, had a gain as a consequence. Is, is that accurate statement? Yes, Member Gray. So um, our immigrant numbers, uh, we normally start with about 9,000 students every year, and then this uh, past school year, we ended up the year with 13,000 students. So yes, we did have an increase. That's correct. So that's great news. And, and you know, that's a testimonial to not only yourself, Elena Garcia, but to the staff, uh, uh, Van Ayers, I mean, excuse me, Superintendent Ayers. It's just the good work that you're, usually, you're utilizing the money wisely, and it's affecting positively our Hispanic uh, learners and readers. So that's good news. I wanted that to be known, uh, and that's why I called it out. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gray. I mean, Member Rendon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I just want to thank your department for taking the extra time to really do the deep dive because, you know, part of this was not just the platform. We want to make sure that the teachers really have a good tool. I mean, at the end of the day, that was one of my concerns that we've been using it over and over again, but we really haven't been able to pull a lot of data from it, which was a concern of mine because it's a 50% data-driven system, and then it's a 50% strategies, and we're not really being able to collate whether this particular curriculum is addressing our needs of a student because we're not pulling the data. So um, I do thank you guys for pulling that. Um, one of the other issues I had was, what is your strategy moving forward when we're gone with ESSER? And so you've addressed that, and you've got other um, resources that you are planning on utilizing when it comes to correct um, curriculum and other um grants that we're looking at. Um, but again, I really want to make sure that we take into account, we, we have had um, over 77,000 hits in utilizing the program. However, we don't know how many people are utilizing the program. We only know that that's how many times they've gone into the program. And so it would be nice if we could get some correlation between the tools that we're using and what students are actually doing. Um, the other thing is, I don't see where we've researched any other options. Um, and I know we're kind of limited, but I think there's been a growth in this type of curriculum, in this type of platform um, within our country. Our Hispanic population is expanding exponentially. And so I think we need to look and make sure this is the right platform we're using since we're really not accessing a lot of data to make sure that there's a correlation between the increases and this platform because we don't even know if every teacher that is teaching AL is actually using it. And because we don't know that, I will vote for it today, but these are the questions I'm going to be looking at answers for um, because I wanna make sure that we are providing the best possible curriculum and resources for our teachers. Let's be realistic when we are working with a lot of students with English as a second language, at the end of the day, these teachers are addressing many needs, not just their learning. And so the less we can put additional strain on them, the better and give them the best tools 
is good. So again, thank you for getting as much information as you can, but I am looking at not just how many hits on the program, but how many users were really using it. And then is there a correlation between our increases and the strategies that they're pulling from here? So thank you guys. Thank you, Member Rendon. I think we're looking at that with a lot of the materials and a lot of the technology that we're using in our district because there is access to so much technology. So I think that board members are looking for when we have these expenditures, what is it looking like? Are we using it? Are we implementing it? Are the teachers using it? And then really having a survey to follow up to see are they finding it useful and do they want to continue with it? I think, um, you know, in, in District 1, that has been the highest increase of Hispanic students at Alonzo. If you look at the top five, they're all coming in my area. And I just want to say that um, this, this, all of you are doing a great job. I also want to welcome Christina Fernandez, former principal at Menden Hall, who's also going to be working with you, and Rebecca Salgado. We're excited. Um, so we, we have such a strong team, and we have so many big plans, because we have to remember, 40% of our students are Hispanic, and a lot of the students who are coming in, it's great, all the dual language programs that Melissa Morgado is setting up, but a lot of teachers need those tools that they're not learning when we talk about teachers that are coming who maybe don't have all that experience teaching or they're teaching out of field and now they have a lot of ELL students coming in they need those tools so this is going to be really important to continue because it's almost half of our student population so I want to welcome all of you we're excited to work together and do some great things for our district for our Hispanic population thank you board members um, please vote when your lights appear And it passes unanimously. Okay, 903 Memorandum of Agreement with the Children's Board of Hillsborough County for the Supporting Empowering Educational Development Service, the SEEDS Project. Superintendent Ayers will highlight this item. Thank you, Chair Combs. And this is our MOA with the Children's Board of Hillsborough County. Uh, Hillsborough County Public Schools has supported the SEEDS Program in collaboration with the Children's Board since 2012. Uh, SEED supports students district-wide by providing services that focus on children being ready for kindergarten, promoted to the next grade level, and reading on level by third grade. SEED supports students by providing intensive case management services that focus on children pre-K through grade three, being ready for kindergarten, promoted to the next grade level, and reading on grade level by the third grade. Dr. Uh, Ms. Myrna Hogue, um, Supervisor of School Social Work Services, is here as well if you have any questions on 903. Thank you. I need a motion and a second to approve item C903. I have a motion by Member Vaughn. I have a second by Member Perez. Member Rendon, you pulled this item? Yes, I did. So, you know, as we know, the SEEDS program is an excellent program. And, you know, the questions I had surrounding it was, we've just had two additional items regarding the SEEDS program in recent six, seven months. And so um, I thank you for giving the explanation that we are catching up. And now we are actually on time in presenting this material. The other question I have is, I completely understand the um, school boards want, not the school board, I'm sorry, the children's board wanting us to have a piece of the pie and making sure that we're bringing to the agreement something. Um, but my concern is that we continue to pull out a general revenue. It's quick, it's easy, it's the way it goes, but there are so many other resources that we can work at. And so I do appreciate you know, Tracy Brown and your staff, you guys all taking that look. Um, we are in the last minute, right, to approve this. And so um, although I'll approve it this year, I'll be looking for another way to fund this $160,000. Um, and then moving forward, any of this we really want to look at because this general revenue is our teachers and it's our staff. And we want to make sure that those are precious dollars that we utilize. So thank you for taking that time. And if you want to comment on what you're going to look at, I'd appreciate that. Yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. We're really excited about this, this particular contract and the work that we do with SEEDS. Um, we will continue to explore other ways of supporting this effort around the case management portion. So we are in the process of looking now so that we're ready next year when this opportunity presents itself again to bring forward this particular item with a different funding source. And I thank you for that effort. I know it, you know, this is the new way of looking at it, right? Every dollar counts for our staff. So thank you so much. Thank you, Member Rendon. Member Hahn. Thank 
Thank you, Member Combs. So I appreciate that you're looking out for salaries, but general fund is used for more than just salaries in this district. And sometimes it's used for resources to support students so that they can be successful. And though I appreciate you looking at other funding resources, it's important that when we go to when we have funders like the Children's Board, that we show that you know we have an investment too, that we also have skin in the game. And so, you know, I think that's important to be a good partner, and I think it's expected. So, thank you. Thank you, Member Hahn. Member Perez? Um, by any chance, could Medicaid dollars pay for this? That is absolutely certain that something that we could take a look at, but Medicaid dollars do hit general funds, so it mm -hmm. will still appear to come from general funds. Correct. But can we flag it to at, show? Yes, ma'am, we can. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, Member Prez. Member Gray? <clears throat> yeah, I'm on the board of the Children's Board, and I know the seeds, uh, and most of us are very familiar with it. Um, the the um, conundrum might be moving forward with more poverty happening uh, and less reading ability that we're now facing as a district. Um, this program will become more and more essential. That marriage, uh, and, and Dr. Han, Member Han, you ma made a very good point. The partnership that we have with the Children's Board has served the marginalized communities. That's their number one um, outreach, and they do a darn good job. They have a CFO that is, uh, uh, she's just amazing uh, and uh, watches the money. We vote on it, but at any rate, I, I find that the growth of poverty is going to be very, very much uh, in, our, in our world as we use those Title I, Title II, Title III, et cetera, funds. But anyway, thank you, um, Ms. Brown, for you know, hooking, uh, using that partnership to the full fidelity. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gray, and I and I also wanted to say that that the Seeds program is such an amazing program for children. There is so much. I mean, poverty. I mean, the layers and layers. As you said, Member Gray, it is. It's. It's just. Uh, astounding uh, some of our teachers are qualifying for these types of programs right so I think these types of programs and this type of partnership we have some great partners and we're so lucky for all the great work that the Children's Board does so I think we need to continue supporting that and strengthening that um, thank you board members please vote when your lights appear and it passes unanimously 905, approve the Memorandum of Agreement for Career Readiness Software, Zello, incorporated for the 2023-2024 school year. Superintendent Ayers will highlight this item. Thank you, Chair Combs. And this is our service agreement with Zello. So Zello is Florida's official K-12 career planning and work-based learning coordination provider, replacing My Career Shines. Uh, Zello's online platform allows students to explore career-related pathways through career matching assessments, exploration of labor market data, interactive career profiles, and college and career readiness lessons. Uh, this Zello platform meets, Florida, meets Florida's middle school career planning requirement, including the career ex exploration component and the creation of an academic and career plan. Thank you, Superintendent Ayers. I need a motion and a second to approve item C905, I have a motion by Member Perez. I have a second by Member Washington. Member Vaughn, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? Um, yeah, my only question was, since we're releasing Synergy and it's going to be so robust and have so many options, I, you know, I just don't understand why we have a whole separate management system for this piece of it. And, I'm, and my question really was, can we gear Synergy towards being able to access this or not access, I better choose my words carefully, um, so that they can provide the same function without us having to hire this additional company to do this. So I wasn't sure, I know I spoke to Mr. Weeks about it, where he went, if, we, if we're going to have the capability through Synergy. I know he said he would investigate it, but is that where we're leading? Uh, member on this this item here is the service agreement. I think the item that you were speaking of is 1003, which is the uh, IPT uh, sagebrush. This one is just our service agreement with our uh, with Zello, which is our uh, career planning guide for our middle school counselors. Okay, I, well, I don't remember pulling this one. Then I must be confused. So I apologize. 
Good thing Clutho's not here right now. Happy you talked about that. Okay, um, it's okay. So board members, please vote when your lights appear. We're on 905. Plug it away. Oh, it passes unanimously. 1001, the piggyback of 20206 PGB LG Computer Hardware Supplies and Services Interactive Panels and Computer Hardware. Superintendent Ayers will highlight this item. Thank you again, Chair Combs. This is uh, to purchase technology required to meet the goals identified in the Digital Transformation Roadmap for updating our classroom environments. This purchase is to further outfit all of the schools not participating in the technology showcase or pilot program. Um, this purchase price is nineteen million four hundred fifty-three thousand six hundred, and this is from our S or three dollars. Thank you. I need a motion and a second to approve item C ten oh one. I have a motion by Member Gray. I have a second by Member Washington. Member Gray, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? Uh, yes. I mean, the comment I have, and, and this is full disclosure, um, when one of the uh, five um, <clears throat> folks come to me, they're regional. Uh, they, they do dis uh, different sections of the district and, you know, validates what I've been sharing with Dr. Weeks uh, and on the dais that, we're only as good, we have our technology and we're moving quickly, but that technology is only as good as who can fix it and it has to be done immediately. You know, you take, uh, and, and right now the report is that we do not have nearly, nearly enough of those right then and there folks, or at least one person to fix it. Um, and the reason this is important is because when a child, and this is so obvious, when a child takes a test, uh, one of these, uh, you know, the computers or even the ELA, you know, curriculum now is matched with the computer. If it goes awry, then that stops the child from learning or it interrupts their testing. So I think I would recommend, uh, Superintendent Ayers, that this be a priority because as we're spending ESSER money, thankfully, on millions and millions of dollars of technology and this energy, we're gonna need to invest in people who can fix it in real time, not, not send it off and have it done you know, next month or so. You wanna respond? And that's just my, yep, hear yes, my cry. Uh, I appreciate the question. And uh, we have had this conversation multiple times. and. Uh, I do want to share with the rest of the board and the superintendent and everybody who's listening uh, the fact that we are looking into exploring all different avenues in terms of how we can get service for any of the technology that are in our classrooms. So we will continue to look at what it, what it would look like if we beef up our internal staffing, what that would cost the district, or what it would look like if we engage either managed service providers or as part of our agreement for pr procuring this technology, we incorporate any of the services into that cost. So we'll continue to evaluate that. Um, for this specific item, we're purchasing the devices outright, um, but we will work on how we actually um, maintain those products as we move forward. We, we continue to look at that. And with utmost respect, um, I think this conversation has been repeated, and I look forward to having a solution because again, uh, our start of the new year, and when we want to raise scores, my goodness, those those one on ones and everything else needs to work. And if it if it doesn't, someone needs to be there to fix it. Okay. So I would like to have and ask for a report as to where we're at, perhaps during the next board meeting, on that. I can I can provide something for the board as a follow up. I would appreciate it. I'll, I think I'll sleep better just knowing we're working on it and we're getting somewhere. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Member Gray. Board members, please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. 1003 revised. Viewpoint instructional planning tool software. Superintendent Ayers will highlight this item. 
Thank you, Chair Combs. Uh, so this is to purchase a license for Viewpoint IPT software. IPT is used by teachers, admi administrators, and instructional coaches to obtain, score to obtain scores, statistics, and demographics about their students. Uh, these rosters are updated daily in IPT, allowing teachers to monitor the progress of their current students, as well as review the data of their withdrawn students. Um, I, we've had IPT for a long time. I, as an administrator, utilize IPT. Um, so this is a, a software that our teachers and administrators are used to using. And is um, my recommendation is purchase price is 109000 and is budgeted in the uh, ITS general fund annually. Thank you, Superintendent Ayers. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-1003-R. I have a motion by Member Hahn. I have a second by Member Rendon. Member Vaughn, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? I have the same comments I had for the wrong agenda <laughs> the last time, which I did pull, I remember, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so this is the one that we're talking about. Part of it is supplementally purchasing it as the attendance piece and all of that for our CTE um, for the administrators. And that was the conversation we had about Synergy and whether or not we could utilize Synergy and kind of sunset this as well since Synergy is so robust and important. So yes. Um, I know you said we were going to be looking at that, but since we've talked, have you had thoughts on whether or not we could use Synergy for this, if, if we're able to sunset this, or what your thoughts were on using Synergy? So at this point, uh, thank you for the question. At this point, uh, we don't have any specifics on how we could potentially use Synergy for this, but once Synergy gets uh, implemented and we're using it in its full capacity, we'll be able to truly evaluate whether or not it can replace the functionality that IPT serves currently and then we can review whether or not we can remove this contract, uh, increase our efficiency overall, and possibly save some dollars on general fund. So when you say we're, what the timeline, because I know we were rolling it out and then there were some setbacks. At, so when do we, what is the timeline currently that we have for the full implementation of Synergy? So next August, so not the start of this school year, but the start of the next school year is when we're looking at the full-blown implementation. Once we have it implemented, then we can start looking at not only IPT, but there are other uh, options as far as other software packages that we currently utilize that we'll examine to see whether or not Synergy can replace. So we're looking at 25-26 possibly is when we would have that? Uh, so we would we would be looking at uh, we would still use this through through 24. So yeah, probably probably end of the school year 24, 25, and then look at uh, replacing it in 25, 26. Okay, I'm getting that on the record, so we can go back and watch that. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, thank thank you, um, Board Member Vaughn. Board members, please vote when your lights appear. and it passes unanimously. We still have 10 minutes prior to um, employee comment. So Superintendent Ayers, we'll start with um, your comments and maybe board comments and we'll, we'll finish up with public comments or employee comments, should I say. Thank you, Chair Combs. So this is my superintendent's update uh, for this evening. Um, so around our strategic plan with supportive organizational culture, just some updates. Um, yesterday, we had the opportunity to bring all of our, our principals and uh, district administrators together for our kickoff event for this, uh, for this school year. It was a great opportunity just to get everyone together. And I, again, want to thank the board, uh, your presence there, Seven Strong, um, with all of our principals, all of our district administrators. Really, I think we, we kicked off the year right, but it's not about just that morning, as we talked about. Uh, leadership is about consistency, right? And every single day, you know, continuing that motiv that motivation and that enthusiasm that we have, uh, just getting it going. This kickoff, though, was uh, was everything that I hoped it would be. And again, I appreciate um, all of all of the board support. Thank you. So we did have an activity. Um, so we had about, I think, 500 of our principals and administrators in the room. And one of the questions we asked was, you know, Hillsborough Strong, with the history of, of Hillsborough County Public Schools, you know, as we, as we talked, what does Hillsborough Strong mean to you? And we had our administrators and principals, you know, put some words and type it in their phone. And, and we collected those and created this word cloud. Uh, you can see um, some of the ones, you know, that the, 
really positive to see some, you know, what the, what Hillsborough Strong, what Hillsborough County Public Schools means to our employees. Um, you need to see the words home, unity, relationships. Um, we have an outstanding foundation to build on uh, for this school year. I have got an outstanding, outstanding team um, here, and I am just really excited about this this school year. Um, Hillsborough Strong. So as we continue with support of organizational culture, what are some of those actions? So what I do want to do is highlight some of those things that, that happen um, out there. So as we can see, with the help of the community, West Tampa Elementary Kindergarten Hallway got a makeover last week. Um, you can see, I think Chair Combs, are you? I think you, you were there, that's what I thought. Um, so you can see them working through it. They had a video that they um, took, and then there's that end product at, at West Tampa Elementary with that hallway. Um, yeah. Strawberry Crest to the right. Um, this one is kind of cool. So Christina Rutledge, shout out to Christina Rutledge. Christina is a uh, IB biology teacher at uh, Strawberry Crest. Her students, her and her students won the Samsung, Samsung Solve for Tomorrow contest. She won um, this for her classroom $100,000. Uh, their students actually made an app um, that it's coded an app to prevent heat-related illnesses. So they won this huge $100,000 uh, award, um, and Miss Rutledge actually took 40,000 of that. So she spent some on her classroom, and the remaining 40,000 she has shared that 40,000 with her colleagues over at Strawberry Crest. So Strawberry Crest High School, yeah. So 40,000 for her classroom, uh, and then a 40,000 that she's um, allotted to the rest of her teachers over at Strawberry Crest. So just that's a, you know you're talking about supportive culture, and there's a shining example of, of Miss Rutledge. So so, Christina Rutledge, if you're out there, thank you. New school year celebrations. Uh, so this Saturday, we have our Bullard Family Foundation Back to School Bash. That's this Saturday. Uh, so it's free for all of our Hillsborough County students, free medical, dental, and vision services, free haircuts, food, and backpacks full of school supplies. At the same time, you know, we have our Tampa Bay Parenting Back to School Fair, uh, and that one's at West Shore Plaza, same thing, free backpacks, face painting. So we have two big events this Saturday. I know, you know, my staff, myself will be out at these events. I'm sure I'll see a lot of our, our board members there as well, but two big events uh, as we kick off uh, this school year. So exceptional talent is the welcome back time. So yesterday, um, we welcomed back our student services personnel, all of our 10 and a half month clerical, our health assistants, our LPNs. Today, our student nutrition managers were back. Tomorrow, our, all of our CSOs, assistant teachers. August the 1st, our bus drivers, bus attendants, uh, student nutrition assistants, and production coordinators. And then August 2nd, that's the day we all circle, right? That is the day that our teachers come back. Um, so that's that first day of pre-planning. So all our teachers and paraprofessionals start back on August the 2nd. This week, um, our summer graduation. So we had our, our graduations in May. Now is our summer graduation. So uh, we want to recognize and celebrate uh, all of our, our summer graduates for 2023. So we have three different uh, venues. So at 830, uh, it starts at Leonard High School. Uh, at noon, we have another one at Alonzo, and then finally at 3 p.m., our final summer graduation over at King High School. Thank you, but I did want to have um, one additional update, and I'm going to toss this update over to uh, Owen Young, our Chief of Student uh, Family and Community Support. We had our just uh, meeting update. We had our just meeting uh, this morning at 10 a.m., um, so Owen uh, and Shay McRae were there. So, Owen, if you could provide us an update on, on that meeting that happened uh, this morning. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Superintendent. This morning, Ms. McCray and I had a wonderful opportunity to engage the community in a very deep, rich, robust discussion. Um, one thing I shared yesterday was access and opportunity. And one thing that's very evident is that the community ability to have access to information and then the opportunity to dive deep into the discussion really, really spent a different feel uh, of their understanding of the possibilities of, of what can be with just. Uh, we continuously shared the idea of a silver lining. A decision has been made, but there's an opportunity. Uh, there's enough research and enough data for us to get this right. And I think the transparency, uh, that was one of the buzzwords that, that was tossed around a lot today, and communication. And I think the time spent um, just bringing the community to, to, to ease uh, and understanding that we are sharing, we're being as transparent with the information and really giving them an opportunity to help decide what this can be uh, seem to bring a different spirit to the discussion today. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, Ms. McCray and I wanted to be very intentional uh, with another group 
who just wanted an opportunity to share their voice that's not a part of the task force. So following that meeting, we went to another meeting just to have uh, discussions. And uh, what I will share with you, uh, there's a lot of new energy out there in our county. Uh, I look forward to the opportunity to really create a strategy and a plan for having them to be a part of the process. Uh, the task force, one of the major discussions is uh, if there are some concerned citizens who've been consistent uh, with wanting to be a part of it, how do we create an opportunity that, uh, opportunity and space for them uh, to participate uh, in the process? So Ms. McCray and I had an opportunity to talk through some creative ways to create opportunity to be able to uh, even respond to community folks who uh, don't want to be in the task force but want to share uh, their opinion and or maybe an idea. Uh, a lot of research was shared today around the possibilities of early childhood uh, learning and again just uh, sharing uh, a plethora of information and really just taking time with them seemed to be the ingredient um, that I think the community is looking for uh, in being able to move this process forward. There are some things that uh, we probably should have done when you talk about best practices prior to the decision. Uh, nonetheless, we're at a place where, you know, this, the this decision has been made. And again, there's an opportunity for us to get this right uh, as we talk about reimagining re just elementary. Thank you, Ms. Young. Okay. Thank you, board members. We will now move to, we, I think we have one or two employee inputs, and then we'll go employee input, and then we'll go to your board comments. We will now take employee input. Even though we hear public comment at the beginning of the meeting, it is sometimes difficult for employees of our district to attend meetings at 4 p.m. There are many ways for employees to make their voices heard, including through union representatives, emails, phone calls, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and public comment at the beginning of the meeting. The board wants to hear from you. With this section of our agenda, we're creating another avenue for employees to speak to the board. We're setting aside 30 minutes for employees of the district to speak to the board about any issues that are on your mind. This is not intended to be a discussion about specific agenda items on tonight's agenda, but rather an opportunity for you to speak to the board about any issues related to your job or the district. Each speaker will have three minutes. I think we just have one speaker. Thank you. Hi, Carissa Denica, Gaither High School. Um, I want to start off with uh, this is probably the first year in for quite a few years where I am excited to go back. Um, I can't wait to get in my room to start working in there to work on different things that I've worked through uh, this year. And I want to also uh, really say that this was a large part, so I want to make sure that she gets her credit, her and her team, Dr. Gail Stewart put together a manipulative training and apparently got a grant to include a class set, 28 uh, calculators, which by itself is around $300 for every teacher that went there, along with other ones. And then her team went ahead and took those manipulatives and gave specific um, lessons that you could do with those manipulatives. That took so much time and effort, and I appreciate it. And she and her team of resource teachers and coaches really need to be seen in there um, with that. Um, she, uh, or at that also gives me hope to really see uh, more of what we need in this district, which is um, more transparency, more communication, more ability to find out the the little people like me who come say this is an issue and the people that can make those changes are willing to listen and not just say, well, this is the way it's always been and so that's the end of it. And I really have hope this year that this is going to continue on and be listened to and because I, I know that I complain, like I get it, and I know I'm critical, but really what I want is I want the best for my students, I want the best for my teachers, I want the best for my personal kids, right? And that's what this is all, all about. Um, and that's why I'm here so much, is because if you don't know about it, you can't do anything about it. Um, so I really hope that with that, um, and then of course bargaining, that is going on, we'll be back at the table on the 31st. I really hope that we continue <laughs> keeping that open 
and transparent and thinking about what's best, again, for the students and for the teachers because in a world where we are losing teachers faster than we can get them, we need to be able to have um, security within our, our, our careers. So that's it. Thank you. I'm excited. And I hope to see you next time with more good news. I love that public comment. No, I'm just kidding. Um, thank you so much, and thank you for always coming and for advocating. Board members, we will now move on to board comments. Um, Member Gray, we'll start with you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, Superintendent Ayers, we did love your kickoff. It was fabulous and uh, very well received. Um, and also, uh, Mr. Young, I am glad to hear that you gave an update of uh, what's happening to JUST. Very, very critical that we know the steps in the early learning, if that was, if that is to be. So I thank you, Superintendent Ayers and Mr. Young, for bringing that up. Uh, I hope we hear it each time that there's progress, each after each meeting, and even between. Um, the community schools, Pablo, do we have a picture of that? I think we agreed, to, yeah. I, you know, we're in a competitive phase here uh, in terms of our traditional schools, and any time that we can make our schools, uh, the traditional um, elementary, middle, high school, more competitive, I think is a plus. And the community schools, um, and, and I have to say, Gibson 10 Elementary exemplifies what community schools are. It brings the business partnerships in. It also brings the staff. It helps the teachers, provides food, provides books, provides books, I mean, supplies, every need, gardening they do. you got the Rotary Club. I mean, there must be a mosaic. You have probably over 30-something business partners, um, and inclusive is health care uh, for those folks that are in need. Um, Catherine Gilmore. <clears throat> she is, <coughs> excuse me, she is a one-woman uh, band. She just operates on full throttle. Uh, also, the expanding of community partnership schools, and I know, Mr. Young, you are going to be bridging some of these, possibly. Mort Elementary School um, are looking to expand their services to other nearby schools. Uh, and that includes health care and USF alliances and all the other community partners. So uh, also uh, going to uh, thank you, Catherine Gilmore. Uh, hope you're hearing this. Uh, the second one, the Bullet Foundation, we did a back -a pack uh, did a lot of backpacks. I know that uh, Member Han and Member um, and Shake Washington were uh, also there. We, I don't know how many backpacks we stuffed, but I think, uh, Member Han, you stayed the latest. So a lot, right? <laughs> yeah, a lot. 38,000. I'm, I'm not positive how many. Um, but at any rate, great uh, goodwill from Titus O'Neill, as always, just maybe up to 40,000 backpacks with full of supplies. Um, and the volunteers, and I think, um, uh, Superintendent Ayers, you must have been marveling of all the volunteers. We might have had 3,000 uh, volunteers there and from every part of the district. So it was really, it's very, it was wonderful experience. Um, uh, next, I, uh, and I'm going next because I have a few. Uh, the, and this came from um, one of the uh, parents at Roland Park. Um, she mentioned uh, Roland Park. Brooke Elkins is a local volunteer who, for the past few years, has connected the community to teachers with her Adopt a Hillsborough Teacher Program. And so what's going on is that she's organizing, uh, helping organize, inform, uh, aids teachers, but basically being a, a, a helper, a provider for all the needs that teachers have. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just a great uh, initiative. So I, I definitely wanted to do that call out for uh, Brooke Elkins. <clears throat> and uh, next, the, uh, Dr. Ross has been busy. All board members have gone to these health fairs. I, I am almost positive. Um, we had Leonard, and then uh, I went to the um, Odover. But but th th there's a sad part of this because 
there's so much need in the community that within two, oh, yes, uh, Colette, you're also, Colleen, you were also there. Um, the need of the community, within two hours we had over, I think, 250 families that went through health services and all the other uh, services provided. And thank you, USF, interns, doctors, uh, and U of T for being there also. Um, just real quick, our human trafficking forum will cover how pornography leads to uh, this huge connection with human trafficking, and that's going to be August 2nd at 11 a.m. Uh, please reach my, myself on the email should you want to attend. Uh, and I think I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gray. Member Washington. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank Mr. Young and Mrs. McRae for and Superintendent uh, Ayers for having that meeting over just the committee meeting. Uh, you make me at ease a little bit. As we say in the military, we'll be at ease. So we got to continue doing what we are doing. Uh, and by the happy birthday of Mrs. Vaughn. Oh. I won't ask your age. We won't then discriminate. We won't do that. But so we had a great time on uh, July the 15th. It was hot. It was really hot out there. Member Gray and Member Hahn and I, we packed those bags. 30,000 they had. But you stayed longer than me, you know, so I, I had to leave. Um, and on July, uh, on July the 22nd, I'm not going to take you thunder. I want to thank uh, Dr. Hahn. It was a great event at Lamb. We had so many people there. And uh, it was really great. Uh, Superintendent and his staff, he was there. And, and also Member Runner and her daughter was there. We had a great time. And people were just, I mean, it was unbelievable. That was really good. So I'm going to stop talking because I know you don't take the show from here. And then on, on, on July the 29th, we will have the uh, pick up the backpack at Raymond James. Uh, again, we'll have 30,000. Hopefully, we'll have that many kids out there to pick up the family packs. Moving on quickly here. Uh, this week uh, past, we had the Cap Alpha Psi fraternity in town, which had uh, about 14,000 Kappas in town. And uh, we brought in a lot of money to the community. Um, it was the 86 Conclave on, uh, on uh, we said, now nah, we don't say Tampa Bay, we say Kappa Bay. So we had uh, a great, we had all these great events in town, and we spent a lot of money, and therefore it built up the economy, which is what we need to do in Tampa. And moving along, as of now, we have the National Association of Buffalo Soldier Troops Motorcycle Club in town. And we have about 6,000 of them. So we're bringing in people into, into the Tampa Bay area that's going to be productive and help uh, build the economy. And that's all I have. I think that's my, my last one. Uh, oh, Superintendent, we had a great time on Monday. We had a great time. It was like on them old time pap rallies we used to have. You know, the band come in, we are, we are dancing, we are having a great time. Everybody is happy. I love to see those happy faces. They were great. It really was nice. Y'all you, you, missed it. It was fantastic. Um, but you know what was greater more, more than that? You know what you think was better than that? You said, you said two words. Hillsborough what? Strong. Hillsborough strong. That's it. We all need to buy shirts to have Hillsborough strong on it. Right. We do it. We really should. But anyway, thank you, Sue. And, and we are, uh, we'll continue to do good. Thank you so much. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member Washington. Member Hahn? Thank you, Member Combs. I'm going to talk fast because I have a lot of things. But um, one, I just want to go back to one of the uh, something on the consent agenda. It was for Positive Coaching Alliance. Um, we, we approved that tonight. They've been a great partner since 2008. And they bring positive character and leadership training to our coaches, our athletes, and our parents. This year alone, they'll deliver 224 workshops to teams across all high schools. They will provide 52 middle school volleyball, volleyball team coach, uh, workshops. And every coach in our district, paid and volunteer, will attend a 90-minute workshop before stepping onto the field. And it is so important as we're, you know, creating a positive experience for athletic uh, athletics uh, across the district. So I just wanted to give them a quick shout out because they're a great partner. Um, Battle of the Books. Host, if we could show the video in one second, Host did a, a summer Battle of the Books. It's the first time they've done it. It was sponsored by Mayon. It launched April 24th. 
Um, students from 14 host sites uh, competed. Liberty Middle, Rampello, Th Th Thonasasa, oh my gosh, Edison, Schwarzkopf, Cypress Creek, Maniscalco, Oak Grove, Miles, and Deer Park. Um, we had uh, students competed for three rounds. Liberty, Rampello, and Thonasasa were the top three. Each winning team received a huge trophy and a Jeremiah's Italian ice party. <laughs> uh, my Italian in me likes that. The remaining sites will get a pizza party for their hard work and participation. So I want to congratulate all students, and we have a video. Okay. All right, here we go, everybody. Record. Okay, it's starting. Make sure you are muted. Your sight should be muted. Um, I, I want to share too that um Maya was a partner in this, and I want to share some stats from their reading over the summer while this is playing. The books accessed in June on, in Mayan were 167,673, 15,000 more books than last June. So kids are reading, and they're enjoying it, hopefully. Hours spent reading in June, um, 17,299. And the street team, because they have a team that goes out to all the summer programs, uh, completed 144 schools across the district. Um, they went to our summer learning sites, host sites, boys and girls clubs, YMCA camps, and Tampa Junior Civic Association. So that was that was great. Um, thank you to host um, and Mr. McManus for for doing that this summer. That was a great program. Um, I did have an event this week, past weekend. It was the pre-K and kindergarten summer bash. It was really to raise a profile of um, the importance of early childhood education and to encourage parents to register, register for three, four, five, six, seven-year-olds um, in our schools and, of course, you know, a Head Start, Peeps, all of them. and. Um, this is the video, and there's some really, we had 1,200 people register for this event, and we had almost 600 attend, and that's a really good, usually you get about a third of the registrants, so look at the dinosaur from the Children's Museum. That was like a seven-foot dinosaur, and it was amazing, and the kids loved it. I want to thank our community partners who helped sponsor this. Um, Fiddlers, Best the Book Bus, Better Together, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were there. All these people were there. Achieve a Credit Union, Mayan, Glazer Children's Museum, Literacy is Key, Brooders Books, Kona Ice, United Way, Tampa Museum of Art, Suncoast Community Health. We gave out backpacks filled with school supplies, art supplies, parent parent information on how to support your young, young learner. Um, we had story time with a, a local author. Um, and we had uh, Miss Tampa 2023 also come and do story time, and everyone thought she was a princess because she had her crown or sash on. It was so sweet. Um, I want to thank the six schools that had tables there and teachers there. In Polito, Bing, Palm River, Frost, Lamb. Lamb hosted the event. Big shout out to Principal Singleton. That was amazing. Uh, Claire Mel um, was also there. I want to thank all the principals of the schools I just mentioned, their area superintendents. I'm probably going to run out of time, and I can't go through every one of them. Um, I want to also uh, thank our internal folks that were there to support families, FACE, HOST, ELL, Student Services, Tracy Bergman, Laura Hobby, she did the Make and Take Art, Volunteer Services, Maria Russ and Holly Sayer for the Mental Health Services. They also did physicals for kids. Health Heroes gave flu shots. HR, Athea Walker was there trying to find us some folks to work with the district. Um, Anne-Marie Courtney, Jean Tavares, Tracy Brown, Laura Cross, Chris Farkas, Chad Lazara, Dr. Hicks from the ELC. They were amazing partners in this work and his team. Shay McCray. How much time do I have left? A little bit of time? Okay. I'm going to go back to the principals and area soups. Richard Grays, Jamie Ger oh, my, my not, Ger Gerdin, uh, Regina Gordon, right? Kelly McClune, McClooney. My handwriting is horrendous. 
<laughs> Seanette Singleton, Cheryl Holly, Gloria Waite, Tamika Lewis, Elise Med Medir Mediner. Thank you, Medina. My, again, it's my handwriting. And thank you to Superintendent Van Ayers and many of his cabinet who came out and spent the morning engaging with families and children in the community. We were, you know, able to really expose. We also had um, Guide Ed as a partner in this, and they're helping parents enroll and figure out the application process. And um, we had folks there helping with uh, the language barrier so that families could speak in their native language. It was wonderful, and I'm exhausted, but I'm going to do it again. So um, thank you all so much. And my husband and my children who came and volunteered many days even prepping before it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Member Hahn. Thank you for all that. Thank you, Member Perez. Thank you. Um, first, I want to talk about the East Tampa CRA that was over at um, – you know, it, it was it was a, a yeah Middleton, but it was an awesome um, event. Um, I was able to talk about the mental health in the community of color, and it was v just very well attended. Um, um, Superintendent Ayers, he it was there, and um, we were able to have an incredible conversation there. Also, um, can we possibly, uh, Superintendent Ayers, place? The updates for just for the community on the suspended agenda, please. Is that possible? Absolutely. Yeah, we can add it as an official Thanks. suspended agenda item. We can do that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And I want to um, also mention Mr. Henry Bullard. He worked for this district over 30 years. He was a shop teacher at McLean Middle School and an adult high school teacher. He was one. He was the one who put our OSD program on the map, um, where he was the first ever officer of OSD. He built a diverse database. He passed away on Sunday. Um, um, and if we could possibly just have a moment of silence for him. Thank you so much. He was actually in this district over 30 years. Um, I also would like to address something. Um, I need to address some comments coming out of Tallahassee that suggest that slaves actually benefited from being slaves. These comments are outrageous and hurtful. The institution of slavery was blight on our country, and to try to put a positive spin on it is just wrong. To suggest that people, human beings, who were enslaved and owned as property somehow benefited from being enslaved defies logic. This distorts history and creates a dangerous precedent. This is offensive not only to me, but to a great many people. I'm speaking as a certified traumatologist, professional licensed clinical social worker. Stockholm syndrome is real. A proposed condition in which anyone in the situation of being captive develops a psychological bond to their captors. When the, those in a place of being captive believe in the humanity of the captor, ceasing to perceive them as a threat. When a person experiences or witnesses a traumatic event, their brain enters what is called survival mode. To help them survive, their brain will switch off certain parts and turn on others. In survival mode, the brain shifts in, to focus to the present moment, creating an environment in which one consistently ready to respond quickly and without considering all possible outcomes. Example of those who have experienced um, hostage situations, domestic violence, human captivity, modern slavery such as human trafficking victims, male victims of modern slavery, kidnapped victims, as well as those who experience slavery. There is no good benefit that comes from being enslaved, having your wife and children sold in front of you. People only learned how to survive this trauma and build on the trauma as a result that forever changed their lives. So I would ask Tallahassee to reflect on the wrongness of this and reconsider. Thank you. Thank you, Member Perez. Member Vaughn. Thank you. Um, thank you, Member Perez, for sharing that. Um, one of the things that I was going to say is actually I, we have a lot of discussion about 
competitive and keeping families in our district. And with some of the stuff that's been in the headlines of the direction, um, both from the Department of Ed and some of the legislation that's come out educationally, I've had both teachers and parents contact me who have concerns about either unenrolling their children in public education because they're concerned about the direction or whether or not teachers and can in good conscience teach some of the direction that the curriculum is coming out and what the penalty for that is going to be. So one of the things that I would ask, um, aside from a reconsideration as well, I agree with that, um, I mean, I can't even discuss the fact that we're trying to frame slavery as possibly being positive in any light, is access to information. I know that right now there's a lot of laws and legislation coming out, and there's a lot of rules being made by the Department of Education, and I know we have some workshops to talk about that, but families are making decisions right now, and teachers are deciding whether they want to continue their career right now, and they want answers to some of this. Like I said, I've had I've had teachers say, what happened if I don't teach that curriculum? Um, and, and so I know that it's rapidly happening, but being able to provide those answers to families who are making decisions and teachers who are considering whether they want to stay in this career could be helpful. So if we had a liaison for that or some sort of FAOQ or just something where, because I'm getting a lot of questions about that, I could direct and have some answers that would be helpful. Um, so I appreciate the conversation around that. Um, also, on a, on, on a different note, I did want to highlight yesterday where we had the joint principals meeting. Um, that was completely a different experience for me <laughs> that I had not had in this district so far. Not sure if I was prepared for it at six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning on a Monday, but it was great. And, you know, since we've changed, uh, we've had a change of leadership, I really appreciate your focus on culture and climate. I think we all agree that's something that we've needed to focus on for a long time. And I think it's resonating through our staff and our community and that it's a much positive change and just the unity in your cabinet. And I think everyone's really excited about this coming year. So I want to say, you know, that's definitely been noticed and I appreciate it. And to our teacher who spoke, you're not a little person. So please don't refer to yourself that way. Our teachers are our backbone and we appreciate all the comment and, and support that you give us and any input that you have so that we can help make better decisions to support you. Um, so it's about to be the start of the school year. Um, I don't know if it's a little early, but I just want to say good luck to everybody. I think everybody's, it's definitely for my term on a board, a different approach to a year. Everybody's really excited. I will say for Mr. Farkas. I am getting some concerns about facilities and I want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to support our schools opening and making sure that maybe we're starting air conditionings early and we're making sure there's working so we're not waiting until school starts to find out they might not be working when our, when our students are in the classrooms because our temperatures have been exponentially rising. And so I want to make sure that, um, it's <laughs> that, that we're not waiting till they're in classrooms. Um, also, the only concerns that I hear coming out of um, from our, our staff is just where we're at as far as openings. Like I have some principals who've never had a hard time filling positions before. I, I think I did hear, hear from Ms. Burkett, we're in a better position this year as far as openings are concerned. So I think making sure that we're letting the public know that, that this year we're more staffed up, but I do have some concerns from some principals. So I just wanna make sure that we're touching base with them and alleviating concerns about staffing because it does seem like there's still an issue with that. Um, I appreciate um, Member Gray talking about adopt a teacher. I know we had talked about maybe recognizing them at, at, at a meeting. For people who don't know, that's a Facebook group that Brooke Elkins did start. It is an, a fantastic place to go. She organizes every teacher wish list by school. So if your student is at a specific school, you can go to that school, pull up that school, see every teacher by grade band, look at their Amazon wish list. I fulfill probably 10 or 15 a year, and I get so much gratitude from each teacher. And they show me throughout the years pictures of them using the supply and that's really great and it takes a moment if you have your Amazon account set up to just give back to some of the teachers who provide so much for us. Um, also, there is a Carewood Area Business Association um, who helps uh, host a new teacher event with us every year. And this year, they're extending it to District 1 as well because Member Combs District touches ours. So any new teachers, whether you're new to the district or you're new to a school, there'll be a breakfast held for you on August 8th, 2023 at Hill Middle School. Um, and so just everyone, I hope we have a great year. I'm really excited and enthusiastic about the new start in the new direction and I'm just I can't wait so that's all thanks okay thank you member Vaughn um, and just a couple things I wanted to 
kind of recognize the young lady out there who who's getting her, I think, citizenship and community badge from Sefner, and she's out here. We have another scout out here today. You know, you know, and if it, maybe right at the end, if you want, you can kind of. Um, it seems like we'll we'll let you adjourn the meeting at the end once I have my comments. She's like, oh no, and I want to tell you, you came to a very calm meeting this week. So uh, you know, and I just wanted to recognize um, McKenna Sturgis, as you know, Alonzo High School has done such a great job winning the flag football, but she did win the gold and junior world championship. And so I'm a news junkie and I saw it like on a, like a big news break. I was like, wow, you know, so I kept seeing her. So I wanted to recognize that. And then, um, also this Saturday, we have the Bullard back to school bashes we've talked about as well as the back to school fair at West shore elementary. Um, there, I just want to thank all the district staff, principals, administrators who are working so hard preparing for the school year. It's amazing. Every time I talk to a principal, they're, they'll tell me something like, if you know a fourth grade teacher, like they're becoming marketing specialists. They're like looking for people and they do so, so much. Our principals, I'm amazed. Every time I see one of them, they're talking about what they need, what they can do, how they can improve. I'm really excited to see all the people in front of me. Congratulations to all your new cabinet members. The, the energy was amazing on Monday. We have so much work ahead of us and I know that together we're going to make a great difference. So thank you all. And young lady, if you want to come up here, we're going to let you um, kind of, you know, close our meeting. This is our kind of like a, you're the second um, scout who's come up, you know, so you're going to come up here and then you're going to press the gavel and say this me meeting is adjourned. And what you do, you can sit there and then you just you just go like this and you say this meeting is adjourned. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. You ready? Okay. Okay. You just press in and then this meeting is adjourned. This meeting is adjourned. All right.